Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Drew Mitchell. I'm the Director of Physical Literacy for uh, the Support for Life Society, and I'd like to welcome you along with our colleagues from Lynn and Pisces in Victoria um, to this webinar on the Physical Literacy Learning Lab, which is a resource recently created uh, towards the end of the summer of 2016 um, by Lynn, the Leader Information Network. Uh, in partnership with Sport for Life and supported by the Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Sport. Um, what we're going to do today is give you sort of a snapshot of what the website looks like, what it does, uh, and then I'm going to ask our colleagues and partners at, at the, the Pacific Institute of Sport Excellence, PICE in Victoria, to share their experience on how they utilize some of the resources housed in the learning lab. Uh, you're welcome to tap in uh, questions from uh, in in the chat box on the right hand side, and uh, we will we will address them uh, potentially on the go, but more than likely uh, at a couple different break points um, as we as we move along. Nice to see we have uh, some American flavor with uh, John from Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, Breaking Bad, uh, one of my favorite shows. Anyway. Uh, uh, this is um, uh, a great opportunity for us to, to share. There's never been more resources available for physical activity and physical literacy than there are today. The challenge for many is how do I find the appropriate ones that are going to work for me and how do I best use them? So hopefully we will um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, so uh, we'll just get started uh, right away here. So again, the purpose of today, uh, the project, sorry, um, was really um, to focus on a couple of key points here. We wanted to increase the access to physical literacy and support the increase of, of physical literacy awareness and knowledge. There's no doubt that physical literacy has become uh, a, a much more popular term. Um, I think there's still some challenges on, on people discerning uh, is what's the difference between physical literacy and physical activity, and sometimes people use them interchangeably, and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, the project was supported, as I said, by the Ontario Ministry of Tourism, Culture, and Sport generously to uh, support work that goes on in the Ontario after-school program, and obviously in other relevant activity spaces. Um, the beauty of the internet is it's available to everybody. So uh, I would like to thank the ministry again and it provided a great opportunity for a partnership uh, between the Leisure Information Network, LIN, and the Sport for Life Society uh, to work together collaboratively on this project. And again, I'd just like to help uh, thank Carrie and her team at, um, uh, at LIN for their great support of the project uh, as it moved along. And uh, bonjour to you, Louise, uh, from Montreal. That's the extent of my French, by the way. Uh, I'm situated in Vancouver, just outside of Vancouver on the West Coast. Of Canada and um, as I said I am the director of physical literacy and work extensively across the country with quite a bit of time I spend quite a bit of time in Ontario specifically so I want to just briefly set the table around physical literacy so this term may be a little bit newer to some uh, and in, again for others of you that you know you're sort of longtime veterans of that so that's great um, Part of the challenge uh, I think we've had with activity over the years is that uh, we've been telling everybody, be active, eat healthy. Be active, eat healthy. It's been the message for 50 years, and uh, I think if you, as you saw the report card that came out yesterday, uh, that was a D minus, by the way, that uh, came out yesterday. It's, uh, our society is, is not very active. Only about 9% of children in Canada get the daily minimum requirement requirement of activity. And if you saw statistically yesterday from, from the report, Slovenia, which is ranked number one, uh, had pretty extensive high numbers. Uh, I think it was up in the 80, 80, high 70s or 80s for the boys and high, you know, mid to high 70s for the girls. So it was, it was really quite impressive. And a lot of what they do is uh, they've made it quite mandatory and extensive and well supported in their school system which again is a, 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 an interesting dynamic that we're not seeing as well supported in Canada in our public school system. So with physical literacy, it really is about building that movement competence, that ability 
that that the build the confident mover so that they have some skills and when you have some skills and a little bit of confidence you you generally tend to be more active so the double directional arrow there is really built around the fact that if we actually do step one first, which is build physical literacy and build that movement confidence, then uh, we actually support uh, more physical activity happening. But the reason the arrow is in both, play, both directions is you actually need to do physical activity, games and, and, uh, games and, and activities, to build physical literacy. So they are symbiotic in, in that perspective. But the idea is if we if we have a skills based approach. So the idea of kids just running around. So if they in a school based setting or an, even an after school based setting, if people are just let loose in the gym and they're kind of running around with no real structure and intention around that, that's fine. It blows steam off and they and they get some heart pumping activity. But there's no intentional skill development in that. Uh, and so that's the lost opportunity. Is how can we take every physical activity opportunity? And at least have some intentional skill developing opportunity. So if we if you do more physical activity, one of the bonuses is you will become more physically fit. So the linkage between physical literacy, physical activity, and physical fitness is they support each other. Uh, and uh, hopefully, we hope that if we build a, a solid base for people when they're younger, they will be more active for life as they age and get into their later years. Now, one of the other things that's uh, interesting as well is um, is we do we do see that if we build a level of physical fitness and have a level of physical literacy, we can build durability, and that's what we want our kids to be. We want to build our kids and our adults into superheroes. Is we want to ensure that they are durable, and that's the opportunity that exists in all of our space, all of our activity spaces. Is how do we make those activity spaces? quality physical literacy experiences. Okay, so I just wanted to sort of set the table with that, and then we'll move now into uh, the design and the structure of the, uh, of the learning lab. So the learning lab itself is, is built around uh, starting to categorize and house resources to make it a little bit easier for you to, to find things. So again, this is, a, this is a sort of the front end look of what the learning lab has. You see the different tabs on the left-hand side. It starts to let you search for various topics as you move forward. Um, obviously, we start off with a definition of what physical literacy is. It is the motivation, confidence, physical competence. Sometimes people call that ability, knowledge, and understanding. Uh, to ultimately, where we want to get everybody to is to value being active, to value the importance of activity. And I think what's happened for a lot of people is they've, they've not developed enough physical competence or skill uh, to develop that level of confidence to start to even uh, value what they're doing. And uh, for those of you that have a little bit more age in you on the call today, when we were kids, we did a lot of this organically. When we tore up out of the house and, and uh, hooked up with our friends and climbed trees and made up games, so a lot of that was happening in the past does not happen today for the most part. There are some pockets of it here and there, you know, a fairly active cul-de-sac, which is connected to a green space. But our young people's connection to the green space has really, really been minimized. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a concern. It's a concern for their health. And it's also a concern uh, not only for their physical health, but their mental health. And so I think there's a lot of opportunities from the resources in here to start to relook at the way we do activity. So in the what we've done is we've taken a an assess me, show me, teach me, activate me approach to the lab. And the idea is is that we we do focus a little bit on the assess me component because if we truly truly value something, we will actually measure it. And, uh, and, and monitor it over time. And one of the things that's been very interesting in the Ontario after school space where they currently use the play tools, uh, the physical literacy assessment for youth tools, is that three years ago when we first started using the tools there in the after school space, when an after school leader actually was given the time to look at young Johnny or young Janie 
one-on-one -on -one and see whether they could hop, skip, jump, throw. They found out that Johnny couldn't throw. And it was very, very informative for the leader. Now, this could be a coach. This could be an, a rec programmer. This could be a teacher. Um, but in this particular case, it was an after-school leader. And the, the interesting thing is, is that when they did find that out, well, what they can do is it, it allows that, that information to inform the instruction that goes on next with that child. And so it gives us more information around what to do. Now, there are actually three sets of tools, actually four sets of tools that are currently available um, for assessment of physical literacy. Um, one of the tools, the fundamental, the FMS tracker actually assesses fundamental movement skills only. Um, the, uh, the CAPL tool assesses physical literacy and fitness. Uh, the Passport for Life tool is, uh, is a tool that's used in the school space for teachers and students. And the play tools are used in a number of different environments. So the, uh, the assessment component is, is an important part. And, and I do want to emphasize it because I think it is important that we do start being a bit more intentional around informing ourselves to the skill level or lack of skill level of the kids or clients we work with. Because again, this is not just solely the domain for children and youth. Okay, we need to be thinking about our athletes, our, our adults being active as well. So when we go into the assessment section, you can see the four tools here and you can click on the tools. It gives you a brief description of each of them, okay? And uh, each of the tools has very informative websites to help you under get a better understanding. Um, there's static materials like PDFs of workbooks and so on and so forth. There are video-based tools to help you uh, guide your guide your uh, you know your own knowledge around being able to use the tools. There's information about potential workshops that you might be able to set up in your community if you want to learn more about these tools. But I, I strongly recommend that you look at these four different tools and see, you know, which of these tools might fit in your setting, uh, depending on where it is, and provide you with information to make your programs better or your practice better, whatever it is you do. The Teach Me section really starts to, you know, once we've assessed and sort of got an idea of where our, uh, you know, our group of kids uh, or our after-school group or our class of kids, our program of kids or our team of kids, because we gather these kids in various ways, you can go and uh, you can click on Teach Me and uh, lots of, there's a plethora of resources that are available here. This is just a small snapshot of some. And, and actually, our uh, Sarah from Pisces will will talk more in depth around some of the programs that they've found to be very valuable in in the innovative work that they're doing uh, at Pisces in Victoria, British Columbia. The Activate Me uh, one uh, allows you to uh, drill in and find if there's various training events or opportunities that may be out there. Um, also, various events you may participate in. Um, but there's lots of different stuff going on all the time across this country. And or it can provide you information of how you may be able to set up something that might be more customized for your staff, for your city, for your region, um, various things like that. So um, there's lots of different opportunities. So as an example, um, I'm going to be delivering a play tools workshop in the city of Markham on December 14th. Um, and uh, that's just one workshop that's, that's coming up. There's other workshops. There's um, Physical Literacy 301 workshops, which are how do you integrate physical literacy into your programs or practice. A number of them are coming up, and there's one coming up on November 26th in Milton and various other things. So if you are interested in that, just draw, put a note in the chat box or drop us a note uh, afterwards, and we'd be happy to share you. Um, the uh, Canadian Assessment of Physical Literacy, the CAPL, uh, the CAPL group does do training on, on a regular basis as well. So there's other groups that are doing stuff and offer it up for staff training and, and, and uh, building people's knowledge. Um, obviously, a Q&A corner. Everybody has a Q&A. Um, what this does is help sort of spur on 
um, various questions and provide those answers for you. Uh, the what, why, where, and how. Uh, we've gone through it with that sort of approach to try and use an inquiry-based type approach here to help people um, get a better understanding around what physical literacy is, what are the components of physical literacy, um, you know, what kind of environment, because uh, really what you do in developing physical literacy is you create the environment and the opportunity for physical literacy to be developed. You don't teach physical literacy, it's just like you don't teach literacy. You teach people how to read and write and they become more literate. You teach people how to move and move better and you teach them how to be physically literate. And so that's the, the difference in those situations as we, as we move along. Um, the, uh, the difference between fundamental movement skills and physical literacy, sometimes people get this a little mixed up. And, and fundamental movement skills are, uh, I think as you saw you, um, um, I, think, uh, I think you saw uh, in the definition that f movement skills or physical competence was one of the pieces. Confidence, motivation, knowledge, and understanding are the other components. So when you're developing FMS or fundamental movement skills, that's important. For sure, it's an important component. But we also want to develop confidence and motivation and knowledge and understanding to help build out that full physical literacy component. Okay, so it's an important thing to, to understand the difference between those uh, two things. Um, why is physical literacy important? There's lots of different reasons why it is. Um, we feel it is the, the gateway to, to being physically active and potentially being engaged in things like sport. Um, everybody will make their choices, but if everybody at least has a base level of skills, a base level of confidence, it arms them with options. And that's really what we're looking at is how do we provide more options for people. And uh, in, in this particular case, uh, you know, we provide lots of different, different things. We've used the human, uh, the, uh, human capital model our, uh, and uh, come from a lot of different angles here, um, that it's more than just activity uh, because activity is also one of the key social connecting uh, components, for, for, especially for kids, is that activity is one of the things that builds their social connectedness. And it's a very important component for kids as they're, as they're growing up. Uh, to feel that social connectedness, to have that socialization with lots of different other people. Uh, I think it's a really important component. Um, where can physical literacy be developed? It can, you know, in both structured and unstructured settings, for sure. Uh, I think part of the challenge I was mentioning earlier was is that kids don't have that same access to the green space that they used to, so they're not getting as much unstructured. It's, a lot of it is structured. Assign your kid up for a class they go and do things, okay? So uh, there's different, uh, different ways to do it. Um, again, just sort of walking, I'm not gonna sort of uh, walk through each of these, but you'll see that when you go through the website yourself, you can start to see how it's designed, how it uh, takes you to various areas and guides you along, and hopefully helps you feel better about activating some of this knowledge as we move forward. Um, how can you assess, we've talked about assessment already, uh, how can it be physical literacy be incorporated in school, sport, and community settings? Because it's a little different for every one of those settings. All that information is there for you to uh, to drill to drill into. Um, how can you support it? How can physical literacy be taught or developed? So it's starting to explain a bit more about the difference between those two things. How do I create an environment for physical literacy development? So. Um, Again, a number, of the, a number of the pages start to, to drill down into the how-to. We also know that physical literacy is a relatively new concept. Research is, is uh, just starting to surface right now around the role of physical literacy as it pertains to increasing physical activity and, and the importance in building uh, stronger, healthier kids and adults. Uh, so the research section of the website is, is, ju is just in its formative stage. Um, you know, there's a handful of papers that are starting to go in there, but there's more and more literature that's starting to surface, which is great. Uh, we've actually formed a physical literacy research group this past year, which is now focused very clearly on, on uh, publishing, uh, actually generating re uh, research and publishing of that research peer-reviewed. So it's moving forward right now. Um, so now, just, if there's any questions, feel free to tap them in there. But um, 
if there are none, or we can leave them till the end, uh, what I'd like to do now is uh, hear from Sarah at PICE and uh, the exciting things that they're doing at the Pacific Institute of Sport Excellence in Victoria. Awesome. Thank you, Drew. All right. So um, my name is Sarah, and as Drew mentioned, I'm from PICE, so the Pacific Institute for Sport Excellence, and I'm the Physical Literacy Supervisor here in Victoria, B.C., um, and today I'll review some of the resources that PICE uses for developing physical literacy in our program, as well as some strategies used to create a supportive environment. Um, and as Drew mentioned, all of these resources you can find in the Physical Literacy Learning Lab. So uh, just a background on PICE before we get into the resources. PICE opened in 2008 and is an independent not-for-profit organization on the Camosun Interurban Campus in Victoria, BC. And PICE brings together um, a couple of areas. So PICE Community Programs, which encompasses community sport and active healthy living development through children, youth, and adult physical activity programs at PICE and throughout the community. So that's the area that we focus on. Uh, Canadian Sport Institute Pacific, which is where they deliver world-class athlete performance services, and they service teams such as Team Canada Women's Rugby, Rowing Canada, and Wheelchair Rugby Canada. Um, the next area is Camosun College, which is the Center for Sport and Exercise Education, and they offer innovative sport and exercise education programs that combine sport, fitness, wellness, and rehabilitation. And lastly is the Sport Innovation Center, so SPIN. Um, they're basically at the front end of researching new technologies to give Canadian athletes an edge. They uh, just developed a wheelchair rugby chair that um, reduces chafing for the athlete, so makes it a lot um, more comfortable to be sitting in those chairs. So uh, Pisces Physical Literacy Program, so part of the community program includes our physical literacy program, where we deliver 54 inclusive programs per week at 29 different locations throughout the greater Victoria area. And these programs include physical, act, um, physical education programs, after school, breakfast programs, preschool, rec centers, and more. And in these programs, we see over 4,000 children in a year. Um, and these programs include populations such as Aboriginal specific programs, general population, and adapted population programs. Um, and then out of these 54 programs, we have eight specifically adapted programs at five different locations where we interact with about 120 um, or so children and youth with various forms of cognitive and physical disabilities and illnesses. All right. So um, now I'll get into some of the resources that we use. So the first one is Maximum Engagement in Games and Activities. Now this is a resource that PICE developed um, a couple of years ago that is available on the Active for Life website as well as on the, um, the learning lab that Drew was mentioning earlier. And um, so actually we'll give kind of uh, a breakdown of how we typically plan our lesson plan. So we typically instruct one fundamental movement skill or fundamental sports skill per lesson plan. And the layout we normally use is about one to two um, warm-up games per activity. And then um, after that, we will demonstrate and instruct the fundamental movement skill and, that we will be practicing that day. And then the kids will individually practice that skill, getting some um, time on task with that skill. And then after, we'll go into some fun games and activities that give the kids, again, more time on task on that skill. Um, to build that confidence and confidence. And then um, we also really like to use games where participants don't get eliminated to avoid creating a negative environment for the participants. And oftentimes the uh, participants that need that time on task will be eliminated first. So trying to have those inclusive games where children are participating and moving the whole time. So mega basically uh, is a resource that Pisces used from various resources online, as well as games that we ourselves have invented. And it is broken down by stage of long-term athlete development and fundamental movement skills. So 
the long-term athlete development model describes the things that um, participants should do and need to be doing at specific ages and stages in their life. So therefore, the breakdown of LTAD in this document allows you to ensure that the activities are developmentally appropriate for the participants um, in your program. This document also includes uh, some sample lesson plans uh, following the breakdown that I mentioned earlier that we used, as well as some strategies for preventing behavior programs, cues for teaching the fundamental movement skills, as well as providing the optimal challenge which is something that we really like to use in our program. So what the optimal challenge is, is essentially a way to make an activity two ways more challenging or two ways a um, bit more simple through providing a variety of the activities so each individual can be optimally challenged. So when a learner is challenged appropriately based on their individual developmental characteristics and abilities, they will experience more success, they will feel good about themselves, and they'll become more self-competent. And this eventually leads to intrinsic motivation to continue participating in physical activity, and therefore a happy participant that enjoys um, physical activity. So these modifications can be done in various ways, whether it be through equipment, rules, the environment, and more. Um, and an example here that we have would be where you're getting participants to do a forehand strike with a tennis ball and a tennis racket. So as you can see in the middle, the Wilson ball with the big W on it is what we typically use. And it's a softer foam ball um, with a larger surface area. So that's your base of activity. One way to make it a bit easier for a participant that may be struggling is to use a balloon. So balloon will sort of slow down the movement um, as well as give the participant a larger surface area to strike. So increasing success. And then another way to make it a bit more easier uh, would be to use a larger balloon or alternatively a hand racket, where instead of having a participant holding on to um, the base of the racket, it's they're putting their hand in between two kind of pieces of paper or um, plastic that they use to strike. So making it a little easier, increasing success. One way to make it more challenging is using it's a bit of a softer tennis ball um, again, it's a progression towards a regular tennis ball. So that's what you have with the Wilson one there. And then two ways up would be using a regular tennis ball. Um, okay. So the next resource that we have is a resource where we partnered with the Canucks Autism Network. And the Canucks Autism Network is a charity that provides year-round sports, recreation, social, and arts programs for individuals and families living with autism while building awareness and providing training through community networks across British Columbia. And they are based out of Vancouver, BC. And this resource is for anyone in the community working with children on the autism spectrum disorder. And the resource is, is intended to serve as a support tool. So it includes various things such as visuals, as you can see um, on the second image there. So visuals you used to allow the participant to predict what will be happening next in the session, whether it be from using a visual schedule to a countdown board, as you can see on the bottom. So if you have a participant that may be uh, having difficulty staying engaged within an activity that they don't feel very successful in, you say, OK, we are going to do five different kicks of the soccer ball. Once we get those five different kicks in, then we will have a reward. So finding something that that participant really likes and will be motivating to them, whether it be um, playing with a light-up ball or a really fun, silly fidget toy. And then in this resource, it also includes lesson plans that we have developed for various age groups of children on the autism spectrum. And it, each one of these games uh, has descriptions where the rules have been broken down in simply three rules. So typically, this is a strategy that works really well for um, individuals on the autism spectrum, as it's really straightforward, it's quick rules to remember, and um, yeah, so that's a really great technique that it includes. And then it also speaks about support strategies for children on the autism spectrum. So this is available on our website as well as on the uh, Learning Lab. 
Another resource that we also use when programming our lesson plans is the Canadian Paralympic Committee Paralympic Fundamental Physical Literacy Resource. And this resource includes various lesson plans for introducing Parasport to both participants with a disability and able-bodied participants. Uh, so it is an online interactive tool with um, uh, that is linked to the provincial curriculum and lesson plans for grades 2 to 6. And it is the first of its kind internationally, and it's inclusive and helps use Parasport as a vehicle to promote physical literacy. So some of the activities that it includes are athletics, goalball, boccia, and sitting volleyball. And uh, it also includes really great ways to use equipment that you already have in order to play the activities that they suggest, such as goalball. It's a Paralympic sport where participants are on their hands and knees and they are, uh, whether they be blindfolded or they are blind, and so they are trying to strike a ball to get it uh, through the net of the team on the opposite side. And so usually they would use a ball that has a bell in it, but an adaptation you can use without having to buy that specialized equipment is pl simply placing a plastic bag over um, a basketball or another ball, for example, so they'd still have that auditory sound of where the ball is in the space. Okay, and then Play It Fair is another resource that we've been introduced from um, people at Equitas. So it's a resource developed to promote human rights, non-discrimination, and peaceful conflict resolution. And it has games and activities for children ages 6 to 12. So these games also include um, questions and topics to discuss after you go through the game such as situations related to bullying, cliques, exclusion. So this brings in that social component to your programming. Um, and they break down games, whether it be by, uh, by issue or age group or um, a really quick small space activity game versus a big active gym game. And this resource can be downloaded from their website. And then um, a couple more here. Bring, black, bring Back Play uh, is from Participation. This is a really awesome resource, super quick to use. You can simply um, go on a web browser on your phone. So it's a web-based app. So it's not a downloaded app, but you just search the link. And it has a bunch of search criteria. So you can search by keyword. You can input the, the age group of the people um, that you're working with, so let's say five to seven year olds and then include the space that you're in so you're outside in the snow or you're inside a gym the number of players you have or a piece of equipment so this is all the different search criteria that reduces the games down to the ones that you can specifically use in that space so it's really easy to use if you're out and about and you want a couple of ideas um, and then activeforlife.com another great resource that we use that has um, numerous lesson plans for children as young as newborns to 12 years old. Um, they have great breakdown of cues as well as um, developmentally appropriate games and activities for promoting physical literacy. And then we have PHE Canada, so again, a great hub that has lots of information on um, embedding physical literacy into PE programs and after school programs. Um, yeah, so you can just check those guys out. And then the last part here is After School for All. This is a guide uh, developed by Dash BC. So they put this together based on feedback that they received from participants and organizations and groups that receive their after school sports and arts initiative. So this is typically actually a lot of the funding that allows us to deliver the programming throughout various after school programs here in the greater Victoria area. And it gives some ideas on things to look for when hiring, um, as well as program structure and different things to take in consideration, safety, first aid. And then the last part would just be a sports-specific website. So yeah, there's a lot of resources available. Um, but if you are looking for sports-specific activities, you simply search handball or cricket or soccer. A lot of resources will come up as well. So um, that is all for me today. And hopefully you guys have uh, learned a little bit more about some of these resources available. 
yes, there are so many out there, so you can just start by simply looking at one, but um, hopefully this will give you guys some good activities and ideas. So thank you so much, guys. Thanks very much, Sarah. Sorry, I was on mute. <laughs> Try to get at it very quickly. Um, uh, really appreciate you giving us your uh, on the front line uh, perspective on resources that you found to be valuable and uh, supporting in in a wide in working with the wide range of uh, of the population that you you guys at Pisces work on, and which is really appreciated. Um, I think. Uh, it's really important that uh, that you do go and, and sort of look around the learning lab. I think you'll you'll bump into a lot of really great resources. It's always nice to get stuff recommended from somebody for sure. And thank you, Sarah, for doing that. Um, it makes it easier. It's almost like a, a bit of a validation program. Um, and uh, we're hopeful that uh, you'll start to uh, you'll start to dive in there and, and find it as a valuable resource again. Um, the learning lab is just a, a, a sort of a, it's a hub to to hopefully provide a one-stop shopping kind of approach. Uh, we'll continue to build uh, the you know the inventory of the of the learning lab as we go forward. That's one of the key purposes to it, um, and hopefully uh, you'll uh, you'll be able to share that with other colleagues. Um, one of the great things about physical activity in the physical literacy space, in particular is that uh, people are pretty good at, at sharing stuff out. Um, doesn't always happen in Canada. We tend to kind of silo ourselves sometimes. So I think it's really great um, that, uh, um, that uh, we do have that opportunity. Um, there is uh, the, the Sport for Life newsletter does provide pretty good regular connection to, um, to physical literacy uh, information. Uh, we usually, uh, a lot of our stuff links out to a lot of our colleagues and partners as we go along, and I'm going to get Alex to put up uh, the way that you can connect to, to become part of the newsletter from Sport for Life. Um, our colleagues at Active for Life uh, do regular series of articles and so on and so forth that uh, usually highlight a, a practical situation, a, a real live person in a setting across the country doing something pretty innovative, or sometimes even really straightforward, but getting great results out of it. So um, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's lots of different groups that are doing things. We're also seeing some pretty amazing stuff coming out of communities and organizations in communities across the country from some, some programmers and, uh, uh, and various people who are working usually with children and youth um, who are really thinking outside the box, which is excellent. Uh, so it's a, it's a really forming and storming kind of time for physical literacy across the country. The other thing I really want to try and emphasize, because I have been emphasizing children and youth here, is there's a burgeoning area around physical literacy and adults, and in particular the older adult. And physical literacy is a strategy for falls prevention, uh, for increasing mobility in older adults, so those of you that work in a more multi-age uh, range uh, context, um, there, are, there are things that are starting to surface in various places right now around physical literacy for, uh, for in the active for life space. And um, I think that, um, that, Alex, if you could also put in the durability by design resource link, that would be great. That's a resource that was created uh, specifically for the older adult, um, just created at the beginning of 2016, uh, and uh, it's a great resource to uh, to help uh, people who are working with older adults and people who you know and older adults themselves to get a better understanding of what they can do. So um, I'd like to open it up to any questions at this point. Uh, we've been pretty efficient with time, so. I know everybody's uh, time is precious to all of you, but if there's any questions, please, please feel free to tap it into the uh, into the box. We'd be happy to answer them now. And if you want to ask a specific question to to Sarah about what they do specifically at Pisces, um, if you want to get involved in any workshops that are currently uh, being organized, uh, any of these sort of things, we'd be happy to uh, facilitate uh, your questions at this point. 
Um, I, again, I want to give a shout out for Lynn, the Leisure Information Network. They do a great job at informing us all and, and in providing the, a plethora, I'm going to use the word plethora, of information. Um, uh, to Melanie's question, will there be, this is the second webinar that we've done. Um, I don't know if we'll do another one at this point, um, but you never know. Uh, we're, we know we need to continue to get this, this uh, information out. So uh, we might continue to do a couple more into the new year uh, generated from Sport for Life with our Lynn partners as well. So um, hi, Rebecca from Dash. Uh, there you go. You can, they, thank you very much for providing the, the resource. Um, yeah, so there's lots of different resources. Everybody's here out there letting you know where they all are. Um, if you do get up, uh, if you do get in uh, to opportunity to hook up with some of these newsletters, they can be really valuable because they, they uh, I call them mailbox information. They come every month or bi-monthly depending um, on what goes on with each of the organizations, but it's kind of nice. It arrives in your mailbox and you click on it and you can find out what's maybe going on in, in around that time frame or, uh, or different things that you, you could, uh, that, that affect the type of programming you do or the type of uh, teaching or training that you do. So um, I think it's a really good opportunity to, uh, to be connected. Um, and the more that we can have that knowledge transfer, that opportunity of sharing, uh, you know, this great practice, this great program that's going on over here, um, you really can, uh, you really can uh, increase the knowledge uh, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So I think it's, it's an excellent way to do it. If there aren't any other questions, what I'm going to suggest now is, Sarah, did you have anything else you wanted to share at this point? She's scrambling Sorry, to get herself off taking, mute. <laughs> taking my mute off. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything more that I have to share, but um, people are more than welcome to email me if you're wanting some tips on the delivery component. Is that something that we we do a lot of with our after school program, so I'd be happy to answer more questions um, by email, so I'll share my email in the chat box here. Excellent, excellent. And thank you again, everybody, for taking the time today. Um, uh, the more that we can, uh, in, you know, create that quality physical, little, physical literacy experience for the people that we work with, um, I personally feel the better um, they're going to be armed to go out there and be physically to be better physically active and to be physically active more often. Okay, so appreciate your time today. Uh, take care. Uh, be great champions as you all are in uh, continuing the movement moving forward. And uh, I thank you again for taking the time. <laughs> there we go. There's our New Mexico uh, uh, shout out. Awesome. Okay, take care, everybody.